New studies suggest that using lengthened partials in your training, as opposed to a full range of motion, leads to more muscle growth. What are lengthened partials and how do you use them? Welcome back. Now real Dr. Milo Wolf here with Wolf Coaching, and today we're talking about lengthened partials. First, why would you actually use them? Well, it turns out we have about five studies now comparing lengthened partials to a full range of motion. In four of these studies, lengthened partials resulted in more muscle growth compared to a full range of motion. Therefore, if you want to optimize your growth, compared to a full range of motion, lengthened partials might be the way to go. Additionally, we don't just have these five studies. We have 20 to 25 studies more broadly looking at the concept of doing more lengthened training, like a lengthened partial, to doing more shortened training. For example, a shortened partial. Very consistently within these 20 to 25 studies, we find better hypertrophy, aka better muscle growth, after lengthened training versus more shortened training. Now you might be asking, why would lengthened partials be better for muscle growth than a full range of motion? Well, there are about three potential reasons. Reason number one has to do with how close to failure you train. Think about it. When you're doing a full range of motion set, you end the set when you can't quite get a full rep anymore. For a row, for example, that might be when you can no longer touch your chest or your stomach with a barbell. If you're doing lengthened partials instead, you will terminate the set when you can no longer complete a lengthened partial rep. And so failure will occur much later in the set. If you were to try doing partials at the end of your full range of motion set, for example, you'll find you can do at least five more reps typically. And so by doing partials, you're simply training closer to true failure, quote unquote. The second reason we've seen in the evidence is that lengthened partials or lengthened training in general results in different regional hypertrophy compared to a full range of motion. So what you see with more lengthened forms of training, like for example, lengthened partials or lengthened isometric contractions, is that they result in substantially more distal hypertrophy. When you're measuring hypertrophy, you can measure it at a variety of sites within a muscle. You can measure it at more proximal sites, closer to the origin point of a muscle, or at more distal sites, close to its insertion point. And it seems like, overall, lengthened partials might result in more distal hypertrophy versus a full range of motion, which then leads to more overall hypertrophy. The third potential mechanism behind additional hypertrophy stemming from lengthened training comes from certain signaling proteins like, for example, Titan. Titan and other signaling proteins that are involved in the muscle growth response may be sensitive to what muscle length you're training at. So not only do they initiate the muscle growth response when you're exposing your muscles to tension, but they may specifically respond a little bit more strongly when you're at certain muscle lengths. In this case, at longer muscle lengths. So now that you know why you might want to do lengthened partials in your training as opposed to a full range of motion, let me explain to you what they actually are. In brief, lengthened partials are half reps in the most lengthened position of a muscle in a given exercise. Importantly, don't think you can just do half reps at any point in the lift and get additional hypertrophy. Specifically, it needs to be in the most lengthened part of the lift. And from this, a question arises. How do you know where your muscles are lengthened within a given lift? Many of my clients have trouble figuring out, for example, where the lengthened partial, the lengthened range of motion takes place within an exercise. Here's how to do that. The easiest way I've found is to have clients or yourself, dear viewer, conceptualize lifts as being broken down into a lifting phase and a lowering phase. When you're lifting the weight, weight go up. When you're lowering the weight, weight go down. The easiest way to think about this is during a squat, for example. If you break down the lift into these two phases, here's the rule of thumb. The first half of the lifting phase, also called the concentric phase, is the lengthened half of the repetition. So if you just do the first half of the lifting or concentric phase, you will be doing half reps in that length position, AKA lengthened partials. Another word for lengthened partial could also be stretched partial. So whenever you feel a deep stretch in your muscle during an exercise, it's being stretched out. That's where we want to do the partial repetition. Your next question might be, where are lengthened partials most beneficial? Well, they likely are most beneficial on exercises where the shortened position is usually most challenging. If we go back to the earlier example of the lifting phase and the lowering phase, on exercises where the very end of that lifting phase is the hardest, think of a barbell row or a pull-up, where the top of the repetition is really the most challenging, those are the exercises and the muscle groups for which lengthened partials are likely going to be most beneficial for your muscle growth. Let me give you some examples. For most back training, for most side belt training, for most bicep training, and for most calf training, the hardest part of the lift for most exercises will be in that shortened position. For muscle growth, we don't want this. 
Therefore, for these body parts and for those exercises is where length and partials might be most beneficial. For example, let's say you're doing a barbell row. Instead of doing a full range of motion repetition and ending the set as soon as you can touch your belly, by doing length and partials, you're inherently making that lift more lengthened. So certain muscle groups might benefit more so than others, not necessarily because of how they're built, right? But more so because of what the exercises that are used to target them typically have as a resistance curve. There's been some discourse around online around certain muscle groups responding or not responding to quote unquote stretch media hypertrophy. The truth is with the 20 to 25 studies we have on the topic now, it does not seem as though any muscle groups don't respond. So while I will say that the back musculature, the side delts, the biceps, the calves might respond most favorably to this length and training style, most muscle groups should respond pretty similarly. In fact, we have evidence in the quads, in the calves, in the hamstrings, in the glutes, in the biceps, in the triceps. So we do have mounting evidence that this principle of length and training being better for hypertrophy generalizes to most, if not all muscle groups. At this point, you might be sold on length and partials, or you might not be. And in fact, people in the past have reported a certain number of issues with length and training or length and partials that I'm gonna address now. Here are some common issues. The first issue is standardizing range of motion or tracking performance. The truth is when you're doing a full range of motion, standardizing the reps can be a little bit more straightforward. You're getting a full stretch, you're getting a full squeeze, and therefore range of motion kind of takes care of itself week to week and is pretty consistent. With length and partials, you have to be a little bit more mindful. How do you make sure that week to week your reps look the same and thus you can use your performance as a gauge of progress, for example? Well, here's a few ways. Number one, on machines, try and find a certain feature of the machine that you can consistently end the rep at. Let's say you're doing a machine row. There might be a pad of some sort that you can pull to. And once you've pulled to that pad, you know that that's your signal for ending the rep and starting the lowering phase again. Likewise, for most compound exercises with free weights, I'm talking about stuff like benching, stuff like pulling, stuff like squatting. For those exercises, you can typically find a position of 90 degrees, right? So when you're talking about a squat, ending the rep when your knees reach an angle of about 90 degrees, or when you're pressing, stopping the rep when your elbows reach an angle of about 90 degrees. Those things can really help landmarks to tell you when you should stop the rep. Likewise, for, for example, Romanian deadlifts and for bent over rows, pulling to just past knee level and then going back down can be a really helpful way to standardize a range of motion. Ultimately, when it comes to standardizing range of motion and tracking performance week to week, just keep in mind that you do this exactly the same way as you would for range of motion. Track your weight, track your reps, and in all likelihood, you'll find it's not that difficult to keep things consistent week to week using the tips I just mentioned. The next common issue with length and partials has to do with safety. Specifically, how do you safely go to failure using length and partials? When you're doing a full range of motion rep on the squat, for example, you can just re-rack the weight after your set. After all, you just finished a full rep, you can just walk it straight back into the rack. So that takes care of itself. With length and partials, you have to be a bit more considerate. It seems like the barbell is kind of the worst tool for the job with length and partials. Dumbbells, you can typically safely fail a rep without needing a spotter, right? You can simply drop the dumbbells. Likewise, a Smith machine, you can just re-rack at any time. And so this Smith machine can be great for stuff like squatting, where otherwise you might have to finish the set with a full rep or get a spotter to safely do the exercise with length and partials. Finally, machines are also great. Typically, they have some sort of safety feature where you can just re-rack the weight safely and get out. So Smith machines, dumbbells, and machines are great tools as opposed to barbells for length and partials, specifically on the squat and bench this is where it seems to be most beneficial. However, if you don't want to use these or you want to use the barbells instead, you can do one of two things. One, simply end the set when you can just about get a full range of motion rep at the very end. So you would start the set on squats, for example, do five to 10 length and partials. And then for your last rep, you would do a full range of motion rep and re-rack the weight. The issue there is it does preclude you from going quite as close to true failure because you need to keep enough in the tank to finish that one last full range of motion rep strong. Alternatively, you could simply get a spotter for your squatting or bench press work when using length and partials and a barbell. That is an option, 
but generally I would recommend using something like Smith machine, dumbbells, or simply a machine to circumvent the safety issue altogether. The good news is recent meta-analyses have found no difference in hypertrophy between using free weights or machines. So just because you're using machines does not mean you'll see worse hypertrophy. The third common issue with length and partials has to do with having multiple goals, all right? Not everyone wants to be a freak of nature like myself and just get jacked. Some people also want to get better at the main lifts, like the squat bench deadlift or the overhead press. Some people also want more flexibility. Here's my general advice. Weigh up your goals and construct your training as a result of how important each goal is to you. If your main goal is hypertrophy, guess what? Most of your training can and probably should be length and partials as opposed to full range of motion. Likewise, if hypertrophy is a secondary goal to you, and for example, strength in the three main lifts is more important, most of your training should be in the range of motion of those three main lifts. A quick note on flexibility. The good news is that length and partials probably improve your flexibility to a similar or greater extent than full range of motion. After all, when you're talking about flexibility, you're talking about the end range of motion of a joint. With length and partials, you're spending the whole set there. And as we know from previous meta-analyses, range of motion improvements or flexibility improvements from lifting and from passive stretching are actually reasonably similar. And so length and partials are actually likely a decent tool for also improving flexibility. However, when it comes to goals, simply consider how important each one is and construct your training accordingly. The next common issue with length and partials or really any specific range of motion is increased pain. Some people will experience more pain when training at a certain range of motion versus another. Specifically, there is some research suggesting that training at either extreme of the range of motion, either in that very contracted peak squeeze position or training at that very lengthened position, like a length and partial, may increase pain symptoms a little bit in people with pre-existing conditions like chronic lower back pain. So if you experience pain, maybe don't do it. Or maybe do it for movements that, that don't hurt, right? Maybe don't do it. Or maybe only do it on movements that don't hurt. The next common issue people have with length and partials is that it's harder to gauge how close to failure you really are. Realistically, it's actually the exact same as with full range of motion. While on some exercises, you might be able to lift more on account of the exercise usually being quite challenging in that shortened position that you're now avoiding, and for some exercises, you'll be able to lift less, like for example, in a squat where you're sort of keeping constant tension on a muscle, nothing really changes as compared to a full range of motion. As with full range of motion, try and be explosive on the concentric phase, that lifting phase, and keep track of your bar speed. If your bar speed isn't slowing down, you're not that close to failure. Equally, if your bar speed is slowing down and you're barely able to get the same range of motion as last rep, that's a good sign that you're just about reaching failure. The final potential issue with using length and partials is that some people just don't enjoy it, right? So what are some alternatives to length and partials? Well, there's a few I can think of. The first would be to use a tempo that really emphasizes those lengthened positions. As we know, length and training is really beneficial for muscle growth. So we wanna find ways to emphasize it. One of those ways is tempo. By controlling the lowering phase or the eccentric phase more as you reach into that deep stretch and less so at the top of the rep when you're getting a full squeeze, by pausing in that fully lengthened position, in that deeply stretched position, and by being as explosive as possible during the concentric or lifting phase on the way up out of that lengthened position, in all of these ways, you're spending more time in that lengthened position and getting more tension in that lengthened position. The second way to emphasize those lengthened positions without doing lengthened partials is certain machines. I'm not sure if you've seen these around, but certain brands like Prime Fitness or Strive Equipment or certain other machines simply have a more lengthened resistance curve. With equipment like Strive or Prime, you can actually load the machine more heavily in the lengthened position as opposed to the shortened position. So if you have access to that stuff, definitely use it. And in fact, what I'd recommend is putting about 80% of the weight in that lengthened position on the lengthened pin, 20% in the middle range and 0% in the shortened range. Likewise, if you have other equipment, let's say for example, you have two machine rows at your gym, but one just feels kind of harder in that shortened position and one feels a little bit harder in that lengthened position. Pick the one with more tension in the lengthened position. Pick the machines that allow you to get the deepest stretch. Those machines are gonna be the ones to give you the most growth. In line with certain machines being a bit more lengthened biased, Certain exercises are also just straight up more length and biased. Compare a cable pullover to a dumbbell pullover. In the cable pullover, you have a relatively even resistance curve. You have a decent amount of tension throughout the whole lift. 
and you're getting a full range of motion for your lats and potentially for your chest, right? With a dumbbell pullover, on the other hand, you're getting the most tension in that fully lengthened position. And just by the design of the lift, it's getting easier and easier as you shorten the muscle and you actually don't get a full range of motion. The exercise is, by design, a lengthened partial. The same goes for dumbbell flies versus cable flies, for example. The dumbbell fly, by design, is already a lengthened partial. So just by incorporating a full range of motion, quote unquote, on the dumbbell fly, you may not actually need lengthened partials anymore. The last two alternatives to just doing lengthened partials are what I call integrated partials and lengthened supersets. When you're doing integrated partials, you're mixing and matching full range of motion reps with lengthened partials in the same set. For example, you would do one full range of motion rep followed by anywhere from one to five lengthened partials after that rep, and then do another full range of motion rep. The exact ratio between a full range of motion rep and a lengthened partial doesn't really matter. What I will say is the more lengthened partials you include within that set, the more lengthened that set will become and likely the better it will become for hypertrophy. The final tool is called a lengthened superset. In a lengthened superset, you would simply do full range of motion repetitions until you get pretty close to failure or to failure, and then you would extend that set by doing just lengthened partials. This is actually the most intuitive way for most people to apply lengthened partials in general. However, I think it's worse than just straight up lengthened partials or than integrated partials for a couple of reasons. Number one is safety. As I mentioned earlier, lengthened partials have a safety concern. By doing lengthened partials only at the end of the set, you don't really get the same benefit because you don't get as many partials or as much lengthened training in, but you get the safety concerns anyways because you're doing partials at the end of the set. So as I mentioned earlier, you either have to stop the set when you can just about get a full range of motion rep at the end to re-rack the weight on say a bench press or on a squat, or you'll have to get a spotter. The second issue is that compared to integrated partials where you can do say a ratio of three to five lengthened partials for every full range of motion rep you do, or compared to lengthened partials where you're exclusively training in that lengthened range, lengthened supersets typically don't actually shift the emphasis of the set that much. When you're done doing say 10 full range of motion reps on the pull down, you might get two to five additional lengthened partials. Compared to just doing say 15 lengthened partials or doing say 10 lengthened partials and five full range of motion reps, the emphasis of the set isn't shifted by that much. The average muscle length that you've trained throughout that lengthened superset is actually pretty similar still to what you get during a full range of motion set. And thus, you may not be getting the benefit from those lengthened partials. Well, let me give you some takeaways. First, more lengthened training, like lengthened partials, might give you an additional about 10% of muscle growth. I would say try it first on back and side delts and calves and biceps and see how you like it. But ultimately, don't feel restricted to just these muscle groups. In all likelihood, all muscle groups do respond to lengthened training and you'll grow more muscle using lengthened partials versus a full range of motion. Finally, if you don't feel like using lengthened partials in your training, there's other tools you can use to emphasize that stretch position. For example, try integrated partials, try lengthened supersets, try picking machines that have a more lengthened biased resistance curve. Try certain exercises that bias the lengthened position, like for example, a dumbbell pullover or a dumbbell fly. Or finally, try and use a more lengthened emphasis tempo. Control that eccentric into that stretch, pause briefly in that stretch position, and then be explosive out of that stretch position. That was the video. If you enjoyed the video, please comment, like, subscribe, and I'll see you guys, my subscribers, in that next one. Peace.